And now, it's time for the Freedom Fiends Agenda live call-in show. Have you swallowed too much of the state's poison? The Freedom Fiends will stick their fingers down your throat and hold your hair back while you hurl. Call in before they get droned. Live right now on Adam Curry's No Agenda Global Radio. Yo. All right. What's up? Hi, Nima. Uh, it's a very special, special, very special episode. The after school ah, episode yes. today. A very it's the, special. It's the no, no coca drill. Put away the coca drills for the day. Uh, live <laughs> in the studio interview with my dad, Jack Dean. How are you doing today, dad? Hello. Hello. All right. So uh, he's visiting. Uh, first time in Wyoming. You ever been to Wyoming before? Uh, just uh, passing through. Not, no, I've not, not seen much of it, no. Yep. Well, Jack's here, and he's uh, he just took a nap, and he's drinking his iced tea or his uh, hot tea with lemon to uh, wake up. He He's not the coffee pounder that I am. Did you cup? You have a tasty beverage today, Nima? Yeah, I got my coffee right here. I'm yeah. drinking it as we speak. Cool. And, uh, yeah, we're going to take phone calls probably in the second hour here, probably not in the first hour. We're going to um, – let everyone talk to my my dad's gonna talk a bit and we're gonna everyone's gonna find out where i got my gift from gab for gift for gab because uh he likes telling stories i like telling stories so um dad we went shooting yesterday huh oh we sure did yeah you did great you did uh we we're shooting 22 at 25 yards in 30 degree weather first time he's used a scoped rifle in decades and I will post his uh, his target, a photo of it. It's <laughs> most of it's within the four inch square, and a couple of them are outside of it. But it's it's pretty pretty deadly for a ninety one year old man. What year were you born, Dad? Twenty one. Nineteen twenty one. Nineteen twenty one. So you grew up uh, in the Great Depression, then. I sure did. I was a Depression farm boy. Yeah. Went to a one room country school. Helped milk the cows night and morning. Excellent. And what kind of uh, what kind of things did you learn there that helped you in later life? You learn how to work. You learn how to respect people. Um, I think it was a great, great upbringing. I went to country school for eight years. Excuse me, six years, and did eight grades, and went to high school <coughs> on my twelfth birthday and started the high school. Yeah, you went to a one-room schoolhouse, didn't you? Yes. Wow. That was 28 teacher, twenty-eight students, one teacher, and eight grades. Yeah, and that was when money used to be made out of silver, right? Yes. Yeah, you taught me uh, when I was 10 years old in 1964. I remember you showed me some dimes, and you said, okay, son, if, if you get any either 1964 or earlier, keep them because they're worth more than a dime. And I didn't listen to you. I spent them on candy or, you know, comic books or something. <laughs> but... Uh, now I'm going back and collecting them and buying them and just for the silver in them, and they're about $2.50 each. That was a good move, wasn't it? Yep. <laughs> Didn't we have a relative that bought a car with silver dollars? What Who was I, that? Yes, that was uh, your mother's uncle and who lived in Nebraska, and he had a business there. He had a, a milk uh, and cream station. He bought furs and sold them. And he took in silver dollars. That was a medium of trade. And every night when he came home, he'd put some in the slot in the stairs. And he he had to break up break up the stairs to get the money out. And then one day he wanted to buy a new Ford, and he took the money downtown in silver dollars. And we had a picture of it on a on a table. It was like uh, thirty four hundred dollars, I think it was. What year was this? That would have been back in the 40s. Or I think probably around After the war? early 40s. Huh. Now, didn't we have a relative that fought in the Revolutionary War? We sure did. Who was that? His name was Ron Hibbard, and he came to the town of Alden, which was uh, about 10 miles east of Buffalo, New York, built a log cabin. He had a wife and a daughter when he came there. He had another daughter born there. He joined the militia, War of 1812, and he was quite active in that. In fact, he got promoted 
before it was over, he was a major. But the thing I like to talk about is the day that the militia was sent down to the Niagara River to cross the river and go over and capture Fort George, which was held by the British. So they got down there, they got up before daylight, and got down there about four o'clock in the morning and had hundreds of men there, a whole lot of boats and canoes, bateaus to take them across. And somebody says, where's the oars? The answer was, they're still back up in the barn. <laughs> they had to cancel the battle for the day. Then, <laughs> then the next battle day, canceled. Uh, battle canceled. We don't have the oars down here. <laughs> so the next day they did it over again, and this time they brought the oars, and they they went up. Uh, Ron Hibbard went across, and he was climbing up the steep bank to get up to the fort. He got a musket ball in his shoulder, which he mm. carried for several years. But he survived, and he was a hero of the war. Good, good. Now, uh, didn't we have a, a relative that uh, – tell the story about Dennis Dean and the safe. Well, let's let's not get off from the war. Just okay, for a minute. Let's okay. Finish. We also had a relative that fought in the Revolution. His name was Joseph Cornish. He lived in Rhode Island. And when the Revolution came on in 77 – 76, 77, he joined the Army uh, Connecticut Regulars, third, third unit Connecticut Regulars, in April of 1777. And he fought in that war. They were all over the New England states, New York City, Long Island. But he got shot and died in the war. He joined in April and he died in August. Fortunately, he left four sons. One of those sons carried on the generations, and that came down to our to four generations to to us. All right. Every time I hear the uh, song, "Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride," I want to say everybody that had somebody that died in the war stand up but i never haven't done that yet yep how do you uh how do you see america different now from when you were a kid it's going downhill pretty fast yeah i i'm very much a constitutionalist i think that was a great piece of literature and they carried it on for years and years but i think we've got a trend here now of too much government and, and I'm not just talking about federal. I'm talking about town, city, county, state, yeah, and federal. Definitely. we got too much government at every level. And I'd like to go back to the old idea of government of the people and for the people and by the people. But I don't seem to have too many friends on that score. <laughs> when, when when do you think you started to notice it? Because uh, I wonder that. You know, me growing up, I kind of always felt like that since I've been an adult. But was there a time when you were a, an adult and you didn't think there was too much government, or did it always seem to be growing in your mind? It's, it started early, and I'll tell you when I heard the first one. I heard Franklin D. Roosevelt in his first radio station <laughs> program, <laughs> and yep. he he was going to solve everything. He was going to have the government solve everything. He started uh, social Sur social security and a lot of things that were opposed by the people because they they didn't want the government doing it. Yeah, and um, well, talk more about that. Pardon? Talk more about that. What uh, what was what was <laughs> what was life like then? And uh, well, what did people think of FDR well, in the depression? I could t I could t talk for two hours about the depression, but I'm going to just take a little time on that. We had a farm. Well, let's let's back up. My father died young. He died at 23 from pernicious anemia. Left my mother with three preschoolers, no insurance, no income. We went home and lived with her folks for a short time. She got a job in a bakery uptown in the village of Sherman, a small village. She got a job in Mr. Fink's bakery, helping bake goods and sell and stuff. 
and she had her sister take care of the three of us at home while she was there. But the, in those days, it was a dairy farming community, and they had a big milk, conden it was called the condensary, where they brought the milk in and condensed it and sold it as, as condensed milk. But anyway, the farmers brought their milk in in 10-gallon cans uh, on a wagon. And in the wintertime, that became a sleigh. And they would take and get the milk dumped and wash the cans and start back home. But they'd stop at the bakery <clears throat> to get a sweet or a cup of coffee for the trip. They, now this one she married had five miles. And anyway, he stopped at the bakery, and he found a sweet. This man had had the misfortune of losing his bride in her first pregnancy, so he was a lone young man in his 20s. She was a young widow with three kids. They really hit it off, <clears throat> and they got married. And he took the, her and the three of us to the farm out about five miles west. Uh, it was on a town road, so we weren't in the mud like a lot of them. But anyway, uh, he, we had the best stepfather in the world. He was very intelligent. He read a lot, very well informed, and he taught us and was very kind to us. And I say we were very fortunate. But it was a depression. And I remember the day that the folks had the telephone removed because they couldn't stand the, the few cents a month for the cost. So uh, so you, you guys drank raw milk back then, right? Oh, yes. Because now they're trying to pass laws against people selling it, even to people who want raw milk. Do you know about that? We, we survived pretty good on it. <laughs> well, you're 91 and you're healthy and you still, you know, take care of yourself and you're not in a home and you can still drive and you drank a lot of raw milk in your life, didn't you? Yes, oh, almost every day in my life. Yeah, the government actually goes into farms now and with guns pointed and takes raw milk away from farmers. Did you know that? No. Yeah. I told you we had too much government. <laughs> yeah. We sure do. How did I people was born, react to, to back up FDR? A little bit. What, oh, Nima? Okay. I was, I was wondering, how did people react to FDR? You said when you heard his radio address, uh, you know, he wanted government to solve everybody's problems. Were people like, yeah, that sounds great? Or were people looking at him suspiciously like, what is this guy trying to do? He sounds like, you know, Mussolini over there. We had both kinds, <laughs> and we had some heated discussions about it. FDR was friends with Mussolini, wasn't he? Or is that not contemporaneous? Uh, he was friends with Stalin. Stalin, that's Uncle, right. Uncle, he called him yeah. Uncle Joe. There you go. Yep. I was born in, in J Jamestown, New York, in a hospital there. I don't know why they took me to the hospital. Most of the kids were born at home. But I was born in a hospital in the same birth room where Lucille Ball was born a few years earlier. Yep. So talk about Dennis Dean, and then we'll get back into the politics of the past. Okay. Dennis Dean and the safe. The first dean in America was born in 1610 in Massachusetts. You say that can't be. The pilgrims didn't come till 20. But there were a lot of people in America before 1620. Uh -huh. And so uh, Samuel Dean was born in 1610 in Massachusetts. And then the next generation was born in, uh, on Long Island. And then the next one was in Stamford, Connecticut. And then uh, Vermont. And then Dennis Dean, who was my great-grandfather, was born in New York State. And his people, his family moved to Erie County, that's the one where Buffalo is, when he was three years old. Then after that, they moved to Michigan Territory. Don't forget I said territory. It wasn't a state yet. Michigan was not a state. Huh. He grew up there. Then he moved to uh, Indiana Territory. And he, he had a rented a grain mill, ran that. He got married, and then he moved to. He had four four sons, seven sons. Excuse me, seven sons. He lost three of them, and the wife 
and then he remarried and moved to Iowa Territory, and he had a grain mill there. And then he moved, uh, before the Civil War, he moved across the river into Nebraska with his wife and kept having kids. He had another grain mill and a lot of businesses. He was a great entrepreneur. I think that runs in the family, and I think that's right down to this current generation that's sitting over there talk, helping with this program. <laughs> but anyway, Dennis Dean uh, had 15 children, excuse me, 18 children, 15 sons, and they really populated the, the whole Midwest. Then my grandfather and father came back to New York State. They heard that thing about go west, young man, and they, they <laughs> went east and That's came to Sherman, New York in 1919. That was before the Depression. You want to know about the Depression? I think that uh, the farm people probably survived it better than anybody because we raised our own vegetables, our own corn, grain, all, all potatoes, cabbages, and we had our own beef. We butchered a brief beef once a year. We had pig, so we had pork. We had chicken, so we had meat, and we had eggs. I think we were very, very rich and well off. With, with no money, we didn't have any money, but we, we survived very well. And I think the country school was a great educational system. We attended that. You went to a one-room schoolhouse, right? Pardon? You went to a one-room schoolhouse? Yeah, I said and, I went to that yeah, for... And graduated at 15, right? No. I went there six years and did eight grades at the country school. Then on my 12th birthday, I went to town school and went there for four years and graduated when I was 15. At the country school, did you actually learn how to do things, you know, with your hands, you know, skills that would be useful on a farm? He's taking a sip of tea right now to clear his throat. I don't think we learned things there to be helpful on a farm, but we I, we had a, a teacher that really instilled a desire to learn. You might think a lot of them used the rod or a, a ruler on the back to make the kids get the <laughs> lessons. Miss Skelly had a different idea. She would say, Jack, if you will get your lessons done well and early, you can go back to the reading table and read anything you want to read. Mm -hmm. It was a privilege. It wasn't an order. It wasn't an expense. It was a privilege. And I, have, I still read a lot. I've got three books right now that I want to read, and I, I don't get time to read them all. I just gave you a copy of Mulan Labe for early Christmas present, a signed by the author copy. I think you'll like that book. It's uh, it's kind of roughly about the Second Amendment, but a lot more than that. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. Who are you voting for this year? I know somebody that said he wasn't going to vote. I know. You're <laughs> disappointed. He's disappointed. But who are you going to vote for? I'm thinking of writing in uh, uh, Ron Paul. Ron Paul. Yeah, but that that would uh, that would cost uh, the other one a, a, a vote. I, I wouldn't vote for Obama if you'd pay me forty thousand dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that uh, that a vote for Ron Paul is a vote wasted? Is that what you're saying? You think a vote for Ron Paul is a vote no. for Obama? Yes, I think it's wasted because it would be a vote, a vote for Obama. But Obama is a <laughs> socialist. He's a liar and his feet stink. <laughs> <laughs> but Don't you think the same thing about Mitt Romney, though, too? Romney is not perfect, but I think he's a little better than Obama. I'd like to see somebody that would get back to the <coughs> back to the Constitution and try to get the government size cut down and get the, back to less government. 
The government seems to not want that to happen, though. I mean, that was kind of (laughs) Ron Paul's whole pitch, and the government was like, ah, don't listen to this guy. And the media was like, ah, don't listen to this guy. Constitution, what's that? (laughs) And they kind of just ignored him. Yeah. The media has not given us a fair deal for a long, long time. Did did they ever? I think maybe they did. Uh 50 years ago, but I don't think they do today. Did people trust the media 50 years ago? Because these days people just, at least a lot of people I know in my generation, just tune it out. They, they don't even trust anybody on CNN or MSNBC or Fox. Did people used to trust the news uh, back back when you were young? I think perhaps, of course, a lot of it was local newspapers, and we didn't have radio. We didn't have television and radio when I was growing up. You had newspapers and that was it? We had newspapers, yes. Newspapers and the Bible. Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, I guess oh. if it's local newspapers, then it could be more trustable because you could you probably knew the people who would write the articles. Like, did you guys know the editor or the publisher, or at least you could see them, you know, at a parade or at dinner somewhere out with their family, things like that? I think so. I think so. But... Uh, I have written for newspapers, but not, let me start over again. Uh, We had a a new weekly newspaper started up in the township here in the county here a few years ago, and they came to me and asked me if I would write an article for it every week. They wanted me to write something called I Remember, Ah. which would be some token of my growing up. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, thank you. That's too much. I'll not do it every week, every week, <laughs> but I'll do one every month. And then I started out and found three other people. I was uh, 90. I found a woman that was four years older than I that had a good memory, and she wrote once a month. Another woman, 89, she wrote, and another one. So we had four people all in their 80s and 90s writing an I Remember and I did that for 23 months. And then I took those articles and got them put together in a little uh, pamphlet. I can't call it a book, but a booklet. So I've got a booklet called I Remember. Ah. Hey, why don't you take some more tea there? Do some tea, take a little break, and uh, Neiman and I'll chat for 30 seconds. And, uh, boy, people are people are responding and digging this. They like it. On the chat room. Good. Good. Oh, pretty, chat. Pretty nifty. I, I forgot you about forgot the, the chat room. room. I no, was not even looking I'm, at it. I'm moderating it. You can forget about it. And and uh, No, I, I, I have to know. I must know what people are saying. Chandler really <laughs> likes that Obama's feet stink. He really liked that comment. Um, <laughs> so I, I wanted to hear about the rest of the story about Dennis Dean and the safe. We never finished that. Okay. Dennis Dean, as I told you, settled in Nebraska while it was still Indian territory. And he picked his spot pretty careful. We had the Platte River there, and then we had a little river that ran into it, and he he looked all around, and he found a place where the river had a stone bottom in a short distance. And he bought that land and built there, built a grain mill, and then he built a real beautiful, big, big, stone house with steam heat and running water. If you can imagine, you know, Indian territory he had steam heat and running water and a brick house, not a brick house, a stone house. And the reason he settled there was because the, the people going west in the ox carts would, had to cross a river. And he assumed they were going to cross on the stone bottom instead of a muddy bottom. And he was right. And those people stopped there, almost every one that went west stopped there and bought some corn to have food on the trip. And he made lots of money. Anyway, the area, Cass County, Nebraska, did not have any government. And there was, wasn't much of a town there. They had no government. So the men decided that they needed one. So they got together at his house one night to kind of set up a government. And the chairman says, does anybody here have a safe in his house? Dennis Dean says, I have a safe in my house. 
okay, you're the county treasurer. You collect the, ta- you collect the taxes. <laughs> and he did that for eight years and never had to stand uh, re-election. <laughs> and he built a school and a church. He helped start the government. It was very interesting. I'm sorry. On the school and the church, <laughs> he... Uh, they, they raised a sum of money and were going to build a, ch- a church. And he changed his mind and said, we need a school more than we need a church. So he took that money and built a school. And then he had to replace that money with his own money to build the church. And he did that. He built the Baptist church there, which I think still stands today. Ah, now, with his own it, money. Well, good. Yeah. With, his, with his own money? Oh, yes, yes, he had to put up his own money because he, he had spent their money building a school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't we have an ancestor that was an archbishop? The history of England shows the, a lot of people, but go back to the 1500s. <clears throat> Let's go back farther. This, in the second century, there was a place called the Forest of Dean, <laughs> which I have visited is a, about 30,000 acres. It's a, a r- r- royal hunting ground to my, in my book. But the the King's was, Deer. It was called the Forest of Dean in the second century. And then from there on down, the name of Dean was quite prominent in England. In the 1500s, there was a, a dean who got named as the Archbishop of Canterbury. And an oddity, and and I don't think anybody else cares or knows this, but the Archbishop of Canterbury that succeeded him, his name was Wareham, W-A-R-E-H-A-M. And that was my wife's maiden name. She was Ah, a girlfriend. And that's the W in my Michael W. Dean. That's Michael's middle name, name too. So Michael Wareham Dean. and, And so he had a a descendant that was an Archbishop of Canterbury, and she was the, the Virginia Dean that uh, grew up in Gothenburg, Nebraska, with the uncle that had the, the silver coins and bought the car. Ah, uh, okay. Now, wasn't there somebody in our family who committed regicide, who killed someone in the royal family? No, I think not. I thought you told me that at one point. You don't want to say it on your radio? No, there was a... When I, I visited England on an adult program in the, in the International Rotary Club. I belong to that. I'm quite active in Rotary. And I stayed with a, a doctor. Who, he was a, an MD, and his wife was a, a, a judge. And I, I spent a few days with them in a wonderful old brick house but there, that brick house was built by the government because somebody had gotten the house torn down by the by the opposition. So, what do you mean the opposition during the war? This was during a. This would have been in the 1600s. Ah, okay. But they had a wonderful place. And they uh, raised their own garden and their own bees. And it came to Saturday, and they said, Jack, I don't have any court today. And her husband went out and did a couple of medical calls early. And they said, what do, you want, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to go see the Forest of Dean. So we did that. We went up the Y River and stopped at a, a museum up there. And those ladies told us that the... the uh, Romans were there very early, but that the uh, Vikings were there mining ores before the Romans. Now, I have a question jumping forward. Um, you've run a lot of businesses, right? Yeah, I've had 12, I have started and operated 12 new businesses. Nice. And there's how many people get a paycheck today because of businesses you've started? Well, this is a pure estimate, but I think. Most of those businesses are, are still going. I have sold off some of them, and other people have some of them. But uh, 
My best estimate is that there's about a thousand people getting a paycheck every Friday from those companies that I help start. Wow. That's so you've great. created more more jobs than Mitt Romney or Barack Obama could ever hope to, <laughs> to, to create. And that is true. <laughs> I, I and these are not for fiction. These are facts. Right. It's yep. not. It's not people digging a hole and then filling it back in. Yeah. I believe that entrepreneurship is the backbone of America. I think that's what has made this country so strong. You go invent a better mouse trap. <laughs> you start making it in your garage. You run out of space and get the neighbor's garage because it's bigger. And then pretty soon you rent a place down the street. And before you know it, you got a business going. And that that hires people. And and I think that's what the, the name of the uh, free enterprise Mm-hmm. Have you have you noticed, uh, you know, from the first business you started till the last business you started, did you notice as time went on the government being more intrusive in what they wanted to know about your business, the amount of taxes you had to pay, the, the rules and regulations you had to follow, the permits you had to get? Have you noticed more and more of that? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> there was a time when you could start a business with very little outside interference. But right today, if you want to start a business, you definitely have to get a a permit from the locals. It depends a lot on whether you're in the town or a city, but either the town or the city or the county or the state. In New York, we have a kind of a greedy state. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Greedy. Does that feel un-American to you? I mean, it, it does to me. I never lived in a time when it was easy, when you could just start a business without outside interference. You know, all, all of my peers, when they go to start a business, they have to do so much paperwork and, and get so many different approvals um, that it's almost risky. Like, they have to they have to worry about getting shut down before it even starts sometimes. Right. Uh, does, it, does it feel un-American to you? I'd say it's very un-American. But uh, actually, most of these businesses did not require a lot of a lot of paperwork or, or permissions. Okay. Hmm. What businesses did you run? Well, one of the, f- the first ones, of course, was a dairy farm. I bought a farm when I got married and had my own cows. How much did a farm cost back then? I paid. I bought. Uh, uh, 95 acres for about, uh, I think it was $20,000. <laughs> Did that include the uh, cows? No. Oh. It, the barn had burned, so I, did, I had to build a barn later on. But it had a house in 95, good good land, had some woods. But uh, nowadays uh, in that county, you get some idle land and uh, – a going price is about a thousand dollars an acre. Wow. So, um, talk more in specific, please, about regulations and how they've harmed you or other businessmen you know over the years. Well, I'd say that uh, many times uh, they prevent a business from getting started. That people can't meet the regulations, so they're 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 licked before they start. In those cases, and in other cases, they it takes a great deal of time and energy and even money to uh, meet the requirements, the paperwork. Huh. Um. Somebody wanted to know. Uh, you got a question there, Nima? No, go for it, Michael. No, you go for it, Nima. <laughs> um, well, I was just going to ask, um, what do you think, uh, and maybe we're, we're doing this a little too early, but wh- how do you think biz- a business should work? D- do you think it was better when there was no regulations, or do you think there's any kind of role for these sort of outside interferences? I mean, do you feel like the businesses you started early on where you didn't have to get permits or follow regulations, do you think those were 
any more unsafe or were there any problems that you think the regulations actually fix or do you think it's just a matter of government officials trying to make a buck off of people i can take a classic example five of us one time in 1964 started a ski resort i think wow. that was your birth year wasn't it michael, yes. michael was yes. born that year five of us started a ski resort we bought 500 acres of land and we did the whole thing, all the way of clearing the trails, building a big lodge, and wow. buying the equipment, and all mm -hmm. of that. And it took us exactly 52 weeks from the time we made the, had the meeting and made the decision to do it to have our grand opening. Well, you know, there was not very much time and effort spent on paperwork for that. We were busy borrowing money and building buildings and cutting trees and we hired a, we were very fortunate we got had access to a, a European ski, I'm trying to think of them, uh, Otto Schneebs. He was an Austrian ski expert and he came over and helped us choose a site and we have kind of a hilly county, and he went to see a lot of those hills. And we finally came to this one over in the corner township in the county. It was a big hill, all wooded, deep snow. It was in December, deep snow. And we took, got Otto, and he went up the top of the hill, put on his skis, and he came down through the woods wide open. He said, anybody got a rope? And when the guy had a rope in his trunk, he tied it on the bumper and towed him up the hill, and he came down again. <laughs> and he says, das is good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we built the ski resort. But we board, We went to the local bank to borrow $200,000. And what are you going to do with it? We're going to build a ski resort. A what? <laughs> they had never loaned any money except for black and white cows and green tractors. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they went along with this, and, and it worked. Wow. Do you, do you feel like people were more helpful back then, or has that not changed? People? Yeah. Well, I th I'll give you a classic example. Let's say that we had a, a farm neighborhood. Almost everybody had a barn and a herd of cows. You broke your ankle or you got sick and had to go to bed or go to the hospital. The neighbors would come in that night and milk the cows at no cost. Wow. That, that is fact. They would get together and, and help each other. What about putting out fires? Was there a fire department when you were young or did people get together to help their neighbors put out fires or both? Both. Yeah. Both. How did that work? Like if... Someone's barn caught on fire. What? Who would show up? Everybody that heard about it. Every, all the neighbors would go. But they did. They each of the villages, like Sherman and Finley Lake, uh, Climber, they each had a. a, a, a first, a, the firefighting equipment was drawn by hand. Men pulled them, pulled the pump that uh, was on wheels, and ran the pump. But then that. that I think that was before my time. That was probably in the teens. But then I think in the 30s, they began buying uh, motorized vehicles and had an organized. In fact, m almost every one of these fire departments then and still today is a volunteer thing. No salaries. Do you think people helped each other out like that uh, because they felt that if they help other people out, then when it comes time for them to need help, they would get that help? Like it was, a, I'll, I'll be a good person and I'll help you out because when I'm down on my luck, I know that you'll come and help me out too? Yes, but I don't think they had that selfish an attitude. I think they were just brought up to think that was the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a cultural thing. It was just what you did. I think that's right. Okay. Uh, we, ski resort was one thing. Uh, we started a, a metal finishing business. The Germans had invented a new method for uh, coating metals instead of painting. And so we uh, uh, got onto their scheme and a couple of guys were f f 
working for a company that made some of these powders, and so they decided to start a company, and we started a company called Erie Creative Coatings, and we would take any manufacturer's part and coat it for him. And the way it worked, we sprayed it on with a very fine misty spray and then baked it at a certain temperature for a certain time. And then if they wanted heavy millage, like a insulating vinyl insulation, we would preheat the part and dip the part in the, in the coatings. And we had big customers for that. We had General Electric, we had Bell Aerospace, we had Zippo, uh, Zippo Lighter had us coating lighter cases. Nice. And then Zippo went into a, a writing instrument. They had pen and pencil sets, and they made those and sent them to us to do the to do the coating and assembly. And this business, we ran it for 23 years, and then we sold it to a couple of young guys that wanted to have a business but didn't want to go through the effort of starting one. Maybe that... <laughs> tells you something there they didn't they didn't want to go through the startup so they bought a business and and they're doing it yet today they're very pro they're prospering in fact i was there the other day and they had just hired a, a, their 50th employee wow wow well i guess there's room in the market for both right there's there's room for people who are good at starting something but there's uh if that person is good at starting businesses then the market would want them to you know, start a business and then sell it and then move on and then start another business and sell it. Um, and so there's room for people who maybe don't know how to start a business or don't want to put in that effort, but are still good at managing a business, running it and, and can take that over, freeing the person up who's good at starting a business to go start another business. And it sounds like that's sort of what you are. You're the guy who goes around starting businesses. I've done a lot of it. In fact, I, I'm 91 and I still have a couple of ideas, but I, I think i would not prove, would not be prudent to start a new business at this time. Well, you can just put them out there and say them on the radio. That way, any young whippersnapper can take you up on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it sounds like um, this back then maybe people had more real charity, whereas now it's charity forced by the government guns to make people be charitable, which isn't really charity, right? I think that's true. I think. Yeah. Now there is one example here that still exists. We have in 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 Western New York and Pennsylvania and Ohio, we have what is called the Amish, A M I S H. It's a, re a religion, Amish community, and these people kind of run their own community. They have their own officials and their own their own rules, and to be an Amishman, you have to obey the rules. And so uh, there's quite a lot of farms, dairy farms today, are owned by the Amish people from from Pennsylvania. You sold them wood, and you've bought cabinetry that they've made from the wood, right? You deal with them, trade with them, right? Buy things from them. Pardon? You've bought things from the Amish and sold things to the Amish, right? Oh yes, yes, they're they're good people. Do you know, uh, I know a lot of people get Amish and Quakers confused, and I know they're not the same thing. One of our listeners who's on right now, a good friend of ours, Ben, uh, is a Quaker. What do you know about Quakers? Do you know any? Are there, they, we have them in New York, right? I have a niece that's married to a Quaker in Westfield, and they keep their religious, have the meetings. They're respected by other people. They're, they're fine people. And who's that? Pardon? Who's the niece? Betty Marie. Ah. Yeah, our friend uh, Ben Stone does the Bad Quaker podcast, badquaker.com. He uh, calls himself Bad Quaker because he's a Quaker, but he carries a gun, and Quakers aren't supposed to carry guns. Right. But he's he's a real Quaker, but he carries a gun because for self-defense, not to be violent or mean or anything. Well, the Amish have some more rigid rules than anybody. They're not allowed to drive a car or a truck. So they yeah. all use horse-drawn vehicles. And so in the Amish community, there be these black buggies with the big wheels pulled by one or two horses. And that's the way they travel. And But now the government makes them put markings on them, right? Don't they have oh, to yes, have license yes, plates? Yes, they have to put a, a reflecting sign on the back of their <laughs> buggy. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. So talk about guns. What uh, what role did guns play when you were younger? I mean, a farm had a gun, right? Every farmer had a gun, and he taught his sons to shoot and to how to handle them and be careful with them. How'd you learn to shoot? My stepdad taught me. Good. That's Grandpa did, Lee? Yes. Yep. Did you take Michael out shooting when he was a boy? Yes. In fact, <laughs> let him tell you this one. <coughs> yeah. Uh, tell us, we, Michael. Well, we were talking yesterday, and uh, we saw a rabbit run by when I was driving. And I said, do you remember when I was about 12, uh, I took your 22 out back and shot a rabbit and brought it in, and we cooked it? And he said, yes. And <laughs> And I said, it was really tough, wasn't it? It wasn't very tasty. And he said... He thought that was more his cooking than the rabbit, but uh, that's the last time I went hunting. And I live in a hunter's paradise now. People travel from all over the world to uh, hunt, and I own weapons that you could hunt bigger things with, and I'm more proficient than I was when I was 12. But uh, I still haven't gotten around to going hunting yet. I think we need to get a truck. I don't think we're going to get anywhere in a little uh, front wheel, two wheel drive car that we can really hunt in, in, in the winter. In a PT cruiser, yeah, I don't <laughs> <A> think <peep. laughs> we call it the peep. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to hunt in that, but um, I mean, I guess really you could you could just go camping and I don't know, walk out in the wilderness and there's antelope everywhere in Wyoming. There really are. I mean, we saw you know we drove from Cheyenne, we picked that up in Cheyenne. And then drove him to Casper the other day. We, it was the last nice day of the year. I mean, he got here on the fall in the fall, and the next day we woke up and it was winter. But uh, yeah, we probably saw two hundred antelope without even really looking for them in the drive up here from the road from the highway. And yeah, that yeah. was quite impressive to me. What did you think of the drive from Cheyenne to Casper? You've never seen that much. How describe it? Well. It was educational, to say the least. Because <laughs> there, there was nothing there. It was a well, vast I'd, expanse I'd been, of nothingness. I've spent quite a lot. My wife and I went back to Nebraska quite often, and they had the hill country, which was big pasture lands, you know, with a, a section or two. But uh, that was rolling hills, and th this is flat land, and I... I I'm reminded of what my dad said. He said, there's there's land some places just holding the world together, not serving any purpose. <laughs> and and that's think, Wyoming. <laughs> I think that's Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be taken as kind of insulting, but I think it's pretty funny. I mean, there is a lot of use to the land here. And, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of it is cattle grazing and oil production and uranium mining and coal production and natural gas and uh occasionally people live here <laughs> well i told michael that if i moved to wyoming i would start a fencing business i think it's all uh i think it's all done i think <laughs> i think someone started that 100 years ago and they just finished fencing everything <laughs> that's what well, i mean i i, I, I never I seen the so much fencing what were you gonna yeah. say, Nima? I was going to say, I think the problem in, in Wyoming is that the federal government owns, I think, half the land or somewhere close yeah. to half the land there. And the state owns a lot of land, too. So that's why the land just sits there fallow is because politicians decide what happens with the land. And they'll usually give it out as favors to their favorite ranchers or uh, mineral rights to their favorite companies instead of letting the market take care of it. Yeah. We have some... Uh government-owned land in Chautauqua County, which is the westernmost county in New York State. Uh, the way this came about is back in the Depression days that I alluded to, the people could not pay their taxes, and they started a, an, an enactment then that when they got so far behind on taxes, the county would claim the land and have, it, have an auction. And steal it. Steal it. That's right. The county would buy it and yeah, but they took some of that land and planted evergreen trees on it. And there's a couple of forests of like uh, 2,500 acres all planted to spruce trees and pine trees that are now 65 feet tall. And they have made those into camping grounds and hiking trails, which is, you know, really serving the people. Yep. Nima? Nima. What? 
thoughts, questions? Yeah. Say something. Something. Um, okay. Well, um, I, I want to hear more about Michael shooting. Is is the only story you have the time Michael shot a rabbit, or uh, did did he shoot regularly? Was he a good shot? Did he shoot oh, anything besides we, 22? I think we practiced and did some target practice then too. Yeah. In fact, I think I, I think I taught him to handle a gun, or thought I did. Tried to. <laughs> Tried I, to. Well, he watched what? he watched the gun training DVD with me yesterday and was. Uh, what would you think of that? Well, I think it was very thorough. Well done. I think it would be great for any beginner in gunning to to view that and try to observe those things. But from my standpoint, uh, uh, it wasn't all effective because, for example, I don't have a revolver. I'm only I only have a couple of guns. Long guns. Uh, I'm not a not a collector of guns. I just have a couple, and I still have some land up in the country, and I go up there occasionally and shoot target. And so, I guess my my capability has still remained a little bit in target shooting. Uh, Michael well, thought see, I was doing pretty good yesterday. Nima, oh, he did. He did great. Uh, Nima, I think part of what it is is that guns weren't such a big thing back then. You know, it's like, yeah. y- you're all excited, like, well, did you go out and shoot? Did you do this? Did you do that? And it's more <laughs> like, you know, he had he had a gun. He also had a lawnmower, you know. Did Michael use right, the lawnmower? Right. Did he get it? Did he, how was he good with <laughs> well, the lawnmower? Well, well, you know, well, well the reason I say it like that, the, re- the reason I say it like that, though, is because, um, you know, when I met you, you had just gotten back into uh, guns and shooting. Yeah. And I, I feel there was probably a period there where you didn't shoot at all, didn't own any guns. In fact, I know there was Yeah, there was about 20 years. I mean, you, you know, I, he had 22 rifles when I was a kid, and we would shoot them sometimes. And, you know, by the time I was 12, he'd let me go out in the yard and shoot him when he was home. I mean, we lived on like four or five acres out in the country. Uh, but, yeah, I didn't. When I, then I moved to cities, and in cities, you'd, you know, you can't have guns in San Francisco. I lived there 16 years. You know, at that time, it was illegal to own a handgun in San Francisco. That was overturned as unconstitutional a few years back, but I didn't live there anymore. And basically, I didn't see the need for guns until someone tried to break into our house in L.A. And then I told my wife, we're getting a shotgun. And she said, no, I don't want to. That's admitting that the world's a horrible place. And I said, sometimes the world's a horrible place. And we got a shotgun and... You know, she ended up liking it more than me even. And, you know, now she carries a Glock Model 23 40 caliber, uh, you know, semi-auto in in her purse 24-7 or whenever she leaves the house and wouldn't leave the house without it, you know. You want to talk a little bit about the, some of the houses we lived in? Talk about the Seward Mansion. The Seward Mansion. Oh, yeah. Uh, Seward was Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State. And Seward was a land land agent for the Holland Land Company when our area was oh. all opened up. And so uh, Seward was there for a short time, and he built a house, a big, beautiful... So wait, you're saying that a real estate agent worked for the government and bought a bunch of real estate for the government? I don't see a conflict. <laughs> is there a conflict of interest in that, do you think? <laughs> the, yeah, the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, he built a big house, a fine house, and he was going to live in it. But then he got nominated for governor of New York State, and he left the county, and he left his brother living in the house, and he never came back. He went from Albany, governor oh, in Albany to Washington and was the secretary of state for Abraham Lincoln. But anyway, the, the Seward Mansion still stood there. Another family got it, lived in it for a lot of years. And then finally... Welch Foods, you know Dr. Welch that got into the the grape juice business? Yeah, Welch's grape juice. He came to our town and built a grape juice factory because we're in the grape country along Lake Erie. And so the Welch company... Didn't his great-grandson put out a flag the day I was born? Didn't he live across the street from us? I yeah. heard that he put a flag out the day I was born. Yes. To announce my birth, the royalty of Welch's announced my birth. <laughs> anyway, Welch Foods had operated, they set that up in 1896, and that company lasted more than 100 years there, and it's still there. But anyway, uh, Welch uh, 
build a building or build a factory, operated at this hundred years and more. But they took this land, bought this land where the Seward Mansion was next door, and were going to tear it down and make it into a part of their truck parking lot or something. And the local historians were indignant, and they got kind of mad about it. <laughs> and so uh, Welch has countered with an offer that they would give somebody the house if they would move it. Mm. And it still didn't happen. So then they raised the ante and went put 10000 toward the moving costs if somebody would take it away. A widow lady there had a few bucks, and she bought the house and moved it a mile up the road on what is called the Portage Trail. And it's been a Portage Trail since the French, and before the French, the Indians had it to connect the two lakes, uh, Lake Erie and Lake Chautauqua and the Mississippi. Anyway, uh, she moved the house up on the hill and restored it. And uh, by an oddity, I, I rented that house and lived in it up on the hill, the, the William Seward Mansion, and that's where Michael shot the rabbit. But uh, the house cost all her money to move and more, and she had a bank loan, and finally the bank uh, was, well, they actually did foreclose on it and were taking it away from her. I was living in it as a tenant, and I went to this lady and said, can I go talk to the banker? She says, I don't care. So I went and talked to the banker, and I says, how much do you want for your your mortgage? And they gave me a price. I went to another bank and borrowed the money, and I bought the Seward Mansion and lived in it for two and a half years. And then I sold it at a profit. I had $10,000 profit, and I gave that lady 5000 of it. I kept 5000 five, kept five, five So I was just kind of keeping my word. How many, rooms, how, many, uh, how many rooms was that house? Pardon? Do you remember how many rooms were in that house? I think it was a 14 or 17 rooms, but it's bigger now. Than some people bought it for a bed and breakfast, and they built on six more rooms. Huh. Um, and they had to cut it into three pieces to move it up the hill, right, on three trucks? It was too big to go over the bridge on the creek. So, yes, they had to, had to take it in three sections and then put it back together. Huh. Nima, you there? I am here. I'm here. Getting weird background noise. Uh, is that you, Nima? Uh, it might be, yeah. It sounds was... like you're at the beach with the wind and the surf going. All right, here. I unmute, I muted my microphone because my wife came in to grab a, uh, a change of clothes, and then I uh, let me mute it and unmute it again and see if it sounds better. All right, let's try that. That sounds better. Sound better now? It sounded better while you were muted. Weird. That's odd. Very weird. Very weird. I wonder if my, my elbow hit a switch that I don't know about. Well, <laughs> um, do you want to play some music in a break? It's we're at the one hour mark here. We're halfway through. If you want to play some yeah. couple soft rock tunes, and uh, then we'll come back. I do. Yeah, we're we're at uh, an hour point here. I think after after the break, do you want to take calls? Yeah, I'll set up okay. to take calls. We'll take some calls. Um, let's do about ten minutes. Um, I got to get a beverage. Or is ten minutes too long? That's about, too long. How about six? We'll do we'll do two. Okay, songs. we'll do six minutes. And uh, yeah, we got to figure out the noise thing. I don't know what it is. It sounds like you're okay. in the wind. Against the wind or in oh, the wind? In the wind. All right, man. You got something right. to play there? Yeah, what what do you want me to play? Let's see. I'm running out of songs by you. Okay, no. how about uh, The Devil Is Us? Nah. Six minutes and 25 seconds. What else no? you got? What else you got? How about hey. one of the old classics? Uh, that was loud. <laughs> that was loud. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any old classics, but... Uh, let's see. Yeah, we play Devil pay. Is Us. It's it's uh it's it's exactly it's long. six it's exactly it's the seconds, it's the length yeah. of the break we want to take. Yep. Okay. All right, here we go. All right. All right. Hello. Uh, all right. Yeah. We're back. Yeah. Oh. Well, Ben Quaker was supposed to call in, but Ben Quaker yeah. left. So um, we're going to take some respectful phone calls now. Nima, you want to give out the Skype and phone information? 
Sure, yeah. If you have a question, um, you can call us at 307-215-5171. I'll go ahead and give that out one more time. That's 307-215-5171. And um, to get it started, I'd like to ask, uh, what was Michael like as far as music (laughs) goes? We did just hear a song from Michael... Michael Dean's Michael W. Dean's band Bomb. Um, was Michael a very musical child, or did he get into it, you know, later into his teens? He was a very musical child. He wanted a guitar. He got a guitar young, and he played a lot. Uh, we had a connection with the. I don't know if you ever heard of Chautauqua Institution. That's a religious and musical community, and his mother operated a business, a retail business called Oriental Bazaar. And with that, we got a lease of the building and we had a a summer cottage, you might say, upstairs and we stayed there. And Michael would almost invariably take his guitar and go out in the park and, and, and play music by himself. He was very a very musical child. Did you guys encourage that? Uh, was it a good thing to you, or, or was he bugging you all the time with his constant playing? <laughs> oh, I don't think he was bugging us with that. I think <laughs> that he he just went and played. We we I think we bought him a guitar. Okay, okay. I wanted cool. drums, but we couldn't find any. I'm glad I did not get drums. Why? Because you hate drummers so much? Drummers are feral. Would you still feel that way if you had become a drummer? <clears throat> no. No. Drummers, they have machines for that, man. They don't need drummers. They have machines for guitar, too. Yeah, but the drum ones are more... Uh, Close to the real thing. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You know, don't you, that Michael had a, a rock musical band for many, many years. Oh yeah, yeah. He he talks about his history uh, with regard to that quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> it was a bi- big part of his life. I wonder though, did he still keep in touch with you uh, and the rest of his family when he was out being a rock star? Did did you still talk to him then, or what was your relationship like? Some, some, yeah. Did you did you ever go see him play when he was with his band Bomb? Oh yes, he. Uh, they 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 were located in California and they went from the Pacific to the Atlantic and back again and again and again and played gigs every two nights a week or three wherever they could get them seven eight nights a week yeah <laughs> but any time they were in our area <clears throat> we would we'd go hear them cool cool did it um how did you feel about it did you did you because I know it was kind of a, a hard rocking kind of scene um, what were you cool with it or was there anything that kind of scared you or what was it like for you it wasn't my kind of music <laughs> <laughs> but anyway there's one detail I have to tell you you know we had two girls and two boys and we said we planned it that way and they've all been to college and I've, I've bought college degrees I've paid for, <laughs> helped pay for seven uh-huh. college degrees. But Michael is the only one of the four that dropped out of college because it was interfering with his career. <laughs> and he started a right, rock band, right. and he did that for 15 or 18 years. <laughs> and so I, I'd say that uh, he, that was his youth. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. Good question. So, uh, yeah. Nima. Um, what do you think of, of Michael's current work? Uh, do you know much about the Freedom Fiends or the movies he's made? I am very, very, very proud of Michael. He's an entrepreneur. He has changed careers many times, <laughs> almost as many as his, not as not quite as many as his dad, but he's changed careers and been successful in every one of them. Why did you change careers so many times? I came up with some idea that I wanted to do, and I did it. That's what I do. And I I implied that I'm close to, I think sometimes, to starting another business at 91, but I I don't think that would be very prudent. If you had to do it again, would you keep the same sort of strategy of, you know, going with your 
your passion and, and trying new things all the time. Um, Michael sometimes says, you know, uh, he does that, but sometimes he's like, well, I wonder if I would stick to one thing if I could, you know, be more successful at it, make more money at it. Um, do you think Do you think it's a good thing to jump around and try new things and, and constantly be starting new businesses and new projects? I think I would not do very many things differently if I had my life to live over again. I think if you get too successful financially at one thing, if you're doing something that's innovative, if you get too financially successful at it, it becomes stagnant. I'm glad uh, that I have more of a, like my dad says, you know, I've worn a lot of hats. None of them have ever made me rich, but that's how I make my living. And that's what I've done also. And I tend to be kind of innovative in things, either early adopter of something and taking it in a new direction or uh, coming up with something in a way that hasn't been done before. And other people get influenced by it and I make some money at it. But I, I think after about five years or so, I think I get kind of bored with doing the same thing over and over uh, and do something else. And for me, that's been a really good way to be because I, I think it would be, um, I wouldn't enjoy it if I made so much money doing one thing that I kind of felt I had to keep doing it for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. I, although you yeah. don't need to do it for the rest of your life, you could sell it to someone else and do it. But but then what are you going to do? You're going to start something new, right? Instead of the same right, thing. Right. Otherwise, you would just keep the same thing. Yeah, I, right. I, I think I kind of like that. It's it's like life is a buffet. You get to eat all the different entrees you want to try. Uh, it's much more fun than, than just ordering one thing off of the menu, right? Yeah, I mean, there was a time when, you know, Adam Curry was just that VJ on MTV. And, you know, that could have been a good legacy. But uh, then he went on and had to go invent podcasting and mess it up for me and give me something to do all the time. <laughs> right, right. And then went and started some other companies. Yeah. Did you get your new toy yet, Nima? I did. Yeah, it when? came. It During was, it was a good. It, yeah, it was a good break for me. Uh, during the break, um, my wife picked up my or didn't pick it up, but the FedEx man dropped off, dropped it off. I got my Newmark NS7. I'm very excited about it. And uh, also during the break, I opened up a. Uh, an Oktoberfest beers to celebrate. So I, I had a very good time during that six minutes. <laughs> I had uh, an interesting thing happen today. I get a lot of things UPS too, like you and FedEx. And um, I was supposed to get this new microphone today. And I looked at the FedEx uh, and it said it had been delivered yesterday and I, I and left on my door at noon. And I was like, I didn't see anything. And I went out there and I looked around i looked at the back door i looked at the side door you know i looked under the snow i looked in the mailbox i looked in under the mat couldn't find it called him up mm -hmm. and uh was really professional but really commanding with him like you know i was really polite to the lady but i was like hello i'm calling about uh there's a package that's it was said it was on your website it was delivered and uh the tracking number is Oscar, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Alpha, Bravo, three, six, nine, or four, two, one, eight. And just really kind of like, okay, get this taken care of, lady. And she's like, um, this is FedEx. That's a UPS tracking number. And then I realized <laughs> it had come yesterday and it was something else. I had the wrong uh, number. Ah, uh, that's, that's hilarious. So I was being like uber yeah, professional yeah. and commanding in my wrongness. And you were wrong. You're wrong, yeah. sir. You are yep. just wrong. Yeah. I had it the other day. Um, I think it was UPS. They left a note on my door. And, you know, whenever I see that, it kind of irks me because it, it means, oh, well, they're, the schedule that the driver is on doesn't sync up with my schedule, so I might have to end up actually going to UPS and picking it up I hate uh, that. or whatever the case is. I hate that, too. But I looked at the note, and what it said was on patio. And I went, to, I went to my back patio, and he had placed it covertly on my back patio to where nobody else could see it, but uh, I could see it. So it wouldn't and get stolen. So it wouldn't get stolen. I would still have it, and I didn't have to have the inconvenience of going to UPS myself. I thought that was really cool. I'm like, why don't more UPS drivers do it that way? Just write down where they put it on your note yeah. uh, and leave you a note. I mean, yeah. I guess theoretically somebody could walk by and grab the note and be like, oh, something good on the patio. Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah, I don't. I don't live in that kind of neighborhood anymore. I kind of did for about thirty years. Live in neighborhoods where you had to keep totally on top of uh, deliveries, and this is before you could check online. You know, it's like if something was coming UPS, you kind of had like 
put a note out there that says UPS, we're home. Please bang loudly on the door. You know, otherwise yeah. the uh, the crack monsters would would grab it and <laughs> slink away into the into the See, cracks. The, the thing is, even these days, even if you live in a nice neighborhood or a nice nice apartment complex, there's always those little teenage hoodlums. Am I right? Am I right? Not They're where I live, man. By. You know where I live. No. I, 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 bet, I bet there's some teenage troublemakers living near where you live that, that probably egg houses and will probably toilet paper houses this Halloween. I've been here three years and it doesn't happen, man. No, we had a new thing with Halloween. Like, I think all the neighbors kind of like whisper about us like, oh, those are those people from California who have lots of guns <laughs> and don't talk to anybody. And uh, on Halloween, we turn out the lights in the front of the house. It's completely dark. And nobody knocks on our door. Nobody toilet papers it. Nobody does anything. We don't really have um, a through street, you know, like uh, it's not really a Halloween destination. They, even back the first year <laughs> we were here, we, we bought candy and had the lights on. And uh, it was, you know, now Halloweeners are mostly, you know, the parents go with them and supervise them. And it's just little, little kids. And, you know, they're done by 8 p.m., and in because they don't want mm. the real monsters to get them. At least that's yeah. how it is in Wyoming. Yeah. Well, I feel like I live in a fairly nice apartment complex. Like it used to be a fruit orchard and they've converted it into an apartment complex. So there's trees, beautiful trees everywhere. It's a gated community. Um, you know, the rent is, I won't say it's very steep, but it's, it's steep enough to where, you know, it's not a lot of poor people here. Um, but the other day, I ran into a group of hoodlums who live here, and they were hanging out by the pool. And um, and we actually first saw them when we were playing tennis, and they were talking about selling crack as they were going about their way. Not to us, just you, we could he overhear their chatter talking about selling crack. And we were like, yeah, right, you guys are retarded. Uh, and then we saw them at the pool, and they had like this really nice microphone. And I was like, oh, cool, they got a really nice microphone. Maybe they're into music. Maybe they're into hip-hop. I should talk to them, bring them over to the studio. We could, you know, freestyle or something. And something was telling me, no, don't do it. Uh, and I realized later, when the cops came to talk to them uh, about a bike that, they, that was, they were accused of stealing, I was like, ah, that's what was keeping me from inviting them over because they, they probably stole that microphone and they would have stolen my microphone too. Hoodlums. Yeah, well, you know, that's the problem with hip-hop. It's like... You know, you can do it over the internet and be safe, or you can be real and get stabbed. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, exactly. uh, Dad, what do you think about the war on drugs? What do you think about uh, that they throw people in prison for smoking pot? I am quite opposed to marketing and using drugs. I don't. I don't want to see. I know what's going on out there in the teenagers at this stage, younger and younger, but it really bothers me. Yeah, but you lived during Prohibition, right, of alcohol? Yes. Uh, did it work? Did people stop drinking? I guess you'd say they kind of went underground with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they've done with drugs. And I wasn't old enough to drink yet then. but Yeah. I know that mother did not want dad to drink beer anytime, anywhere. And once we, we were over at a neighbor farm and they had a little beer and he apparently imbibed and maybe she smelled it when he came home, but he really got scolded for drinking beer. Huh. But don't you think that, uh, I mean, conservatives talk a lot about self-responsibility and taking care of yourself and not having to take care of other people don't you feel that if somebody uh nima you're getting the background noise again can you ride your mic there when you're not using it thanks um don't you feel that if somebody's doing a drug and it doesn't hurt other people that they should be left alone to do it i guess it's their privilege but i don't think they should abuse their bodies that way yeah, but people do a lot of things that are dangerous. I mean, uh, you know, skydiving, jumping out of an airplane, that's dangerous. Do you think that should be illegal? Well, you know, we have I have a nephew that's doing, uh, uh, what's the boat, uh, kayak. And he d does goes to Chile and Mexico and places where they can do the big ones. And I have a picture of Galen going over an a giant eight, giant waterfall 17 yeah. year old going over an 80 foot waterfall 
Well, I guess that's what Michael's talking about. Then maybe that's abusing your body and you shouldn't do it, but that's his life and he wants to do it. And that's a lot more dangerous than somebody, you know, smoking a little weed or something, don't you think? Oh, yes. I'd say he takes his life in his hands every time he goes over a big fall. See, my problem with the war on drugs, other than, <clears throat> you know, it's the government initiating aggression on people who are not violent and there's no victim. If there's any victim, it's themselves, and that doesn't hurt other people if they're adults. Um, but don't you think that uh, the war on drugs fuels the war on guns, it fuels more taxes, it fuels more militarization of the police, more intrusion of our lives, more tapping phones, reading emails, etc.? I think you're probably right. So do you think the war on drugs should go away? I guess I don't really have an answer for that. Yeah, how about a good answer might be more research needed, maybe? <laughs> well, what, what if it was rephrased this way? What if it was rephrased into the government war on drugs should go away, <clears throat> i.e. the government should stop interfering? I think there there could still be – I, I wouldn't parents, call it a war. Yeah. Right, parents I wouldn't call it a war on drugs. But yes, the culture could say, hey, this is not a good thing to do. Just like the culture told people back in the day, like your dad was saying, people would help each other out. And that was a cultural thing. That, that was just what you did. You just helped people out. Um, we could still have a cultural uh, regulation of people's ingestion. See, I think, I think a government regulation. Of I think the honest thing to do is to say, if you believe in less government and there's too much government, is not pick and choose well except there should be some government more government a lot of government in this one situation you know i think it's either i mean a, a moral statement like we need less government i think that's either all or none I, th I don't think you can pick and choose and say well this thing i don't like so they need to arrest right. those people you know well even at its best the government is just that annoying friend that once he gets his foot in the door <laughs> once he realizes you don't have an excuse to not hang out with him he's just going to be there all the time you know uh <laughs> so I, I think yeah if you if you let the government in anything, you know, it, whether it's war on drugs or whatever, uh, then they're going to end up uh, regulating things like the milk. type of businesses you have, the milk you drink, um, you know, the mo what you do with your money, uh, and all that kind of horrible things that the government does. So fasten, uh, you fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fasten your seatbelt. Uh, and not, not just fasten your seatbelt, but, uh, what your seatbelt looks like. Uh, tell I, your story, Nima, <laughs> briefly. Right. Uh, the, the government of Texas, the state of Texas said that I had to have a plastic cover on the outside of the female portion of my seatbelt. I had removed that plastic cover because the seatbelt was not working unless I removed that cover. So in order for me to be safe and have the seatbelt work, I had to take that plastic cover off. Uh, but they said, said no 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 and they wouldn't give me a they wouldn't let me pass my inspection until I went to the junkyard and ripped off another plastic cover and put that on the female portion of my seatbelts uh, so yeah when, once you let the government tell you what you can put in your body uh, then they can tell you what what your seatbelts look like if you in New York State if you back out your driveway without bu buckling up your seatbelt and the cop comes along it's an automatic $100 fine what do you think of that? Do you wow. think that's a good thing or not? No. I I'm, I agree. It's too much government. Yep. Where where else would you like to see the government reduced? I I think that uh, we don't need to have so many committees and studies and a lot of those are just uh, fake and and ways to pass the money to somebody. Do you think there's any way that a lot of the things the government does could be done voluntarily without the government with people just cooperating in business and in charity? For a long, long time, we've had some very good departments in the government. You take uh, Cornell, Uni Cornell University and the Ag Research Department. That's not new. It's not overdone. I think it's done a lot of good for grape farmers, dairy farmers, all all kinds of farming. And I think that uh, m m most of those uh, state agricultural governments have not been uh, not been overdone. Now, let me ask you about that in specific. Um so they take public taxes to do this service that helps grape growers uh 
what if I don't eat grapes? Should I have to pay the taxes on that? <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't have to, but you, you you pay taxes for a lot of things that you don't use. See what right. I think. What I think is that everybody's got their pet projects they like. You know, some people like the university that provides information and research that helps grape growers. There's some people that like the war on drugs. There's some people that want government money to go for abortions. There's other people that want money or government money to outlaw abortions. There's people that want the government to give them free medication. And there's people who want the government to outlaw other medication. All those people will never be in agreement and it's going to be constantly at war. So don't you think most of that, if not all of it, let's say most of that, don't you think most of that could be done privately you know, why does one neighbor have to keep another neighbor from doing something that doesn't affect them? And why does the third neighbor have to pay for something for a fourth neighbor that doesn't affect them? That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, when you when I said to you the other day, I believe there should be no government and you looked sad, that's that's where I was coming from. That was my explanation. I don't think that you could and I don't think they ever will get it down to no government. I think that we'll always have government, but my theory is we have too much, too many departments, too many studies, and we we don't need to continue with those. I'd like to con discontinue a lot of them. Do you, th the thing is though, uh, the government never seems to get smaller. They never really discontinue a never, program. Never. Be be because once they have the program, then the people who are officials of that program get money from it. So they're going to fight tooth and nail to make sure the program keeps going on. That's so right. I feel like I feel like if you have – you start with a small government and it inevitably will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Um, so what do you do at that point, I guess? I think of an, a classic example in our county. We have a, a county health care for elderly people. It's a, a big, almost like a hospital for uh, elderly people. But it's gotten to be such a burden on the budget that the county executives are talking about selling that to private owners and letting them continue it. And I think that might be the answer because we don't need the government to to provide that service if we could if we could get private owner to do it but here's the thing that on the union ha, it's, it's unions in the un <laughs> there's the now we've got a conversation going okay <laughs> we got another half hour let's talk about unions <laughs> the unions are in there saying oh don't lose the county home please keep the county home for those old people but all the union is really wanting is to keep those high rates that they get mm -hmm plus the pensions that they get and all the fringe that they get they don't give a darn about the the people that are in there right they just don't want to lose their gravy train that's exactly what and they put on a big big campaign to keep the county home and right now it's coming up for a vote i think this week or next whether to sell it because they've got an offer of a mega bucks private company to buy it and take it over now I don't like unions. I mean, I guess I would like the idea of them if they weren't forced. You know, we, we say a lot of things are enforced at the barrel of a gun. And what we mean by that is all laws and all taxes, uh, you know, if they weren't enforced by government guns, they would just be suggestions and you wouldn't have to obey them. Um, when, you know, if they tell you you have to pay taxes on your house, uh, your land, and you don't pay the taxes... They'll send you a bill. They'll send you another bill. They'll send you another bill. They'll finally send a man to your house. If you tell that man, get the hell off my property, they'll come back with cops, with men with guns. And if you tell them to get the hell off your property, they will kick in your door. They'll put a gun to your head and they'll drag you out and throw you in jail and then steal your house. And laws are enforced the same way. Um, you know, every law is backed by a gun. And if you don't obey the law, you know, the police will put a gun to your head and if you resist they will shoot you and if you don't resist they'll put a gun to your head and they'll take you to jail so every law and every tax is at the barrel of a gun and unions 
it passed laws that are enforced at the barrel of a gun. So unions are really part of the government in a way. I mean, I guess I like the idea of unions when they first started, when they were a self-defense organization because Rockefeller was machine gunning guys going on strike. But, uh, you know, like a lot of things that start out small and good, it's become big and horrible. Uh, but what would you say to somebody who, you know, has six kids, has a union job, uh, supports his family because he's making $32 an hour tightening bolts. Uh, you know, if you tell that guy unions are bad, he's going to want to punch you. And I've had them want to punch me. What, what do you say to that guy? You just about said it all. <laughs> but let's go back a few, a few decades. Why do we have unions? There was a time, and this may be an outgrowth of the Depression, when we had sweatshops. The people had to work. They didn't get much pay. They had put in long hours and little pay and little benefits and little privilege. And there, there was a need for unions, and I think they served a, served a function. But they have gradually increased their, their hold and their weight and I think, as you, you're right, the, the unions run the things today. And I think that the, they, they are too overpowerful. Uh, they're, almost, uh, they're almost running the government. Yeah. So what, what do you say to that guy, the union guy, who says, well, without the union, I couldn't feel my, feed my six children? I'd tell him maybe he shouldn't have had six children, but... Well, I, I don't want to say that, but I think that uh, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it to his face, but no, I'll say it to no. You. <laughs> but my point is, he doesn't need thirty two dollars an hour for tightening bolts. Yeah, that you could get that done for a lot less if you didn't have a union. Maybe somebody would do it for sixteen dollars an hour and do just as good a job tightening the bolts. Well, that's one of the ideas of eliminating the minimum wage laws. I mean, a lot of people think if you want to get rid of minimum wage laws, you don't care about poor people and i would say getting rid of minimum wage laws would help poor people because there's a lot of poor people who don't have the skill set to do something that's worth minimum wage because minimum wage has gotten rather you know higher um you know there are people there are americans that would do it for that price but someone can't afford to not you know they're not allowed to because the government guns will come in and stop them if they pay them less even if people want to do it I guess I don't have an answer. Nima? Nima, are you there? Hello, Nima. Nima Vidati? Nima. Yes. Nima, Nima. Nima, 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 Nima. Nima. Yo. Okay. Yo. Yeah. Yeah. There was oh. some weird static. I think it was mic cable or something. It was like, sounded like a thunderstorm. That background yeah. noise you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's fixed now. Do you do you still hear it or is it gone? It's less. Oh, it's coming back. The storm's coming back. The storm's coming back. Man, right, what did uh, you do? What did you do? Let me. I don't know. It started with my wife. It's it's wife. It started with wife. your wife. What did your wife do to your she, microphone? She, she came in and changed clothes. I guess her there static. So much static. Her <laughs> static. Her static charge screwed up the cable. Let me uh, let me change cables. Uh, do you guys want to continue on for a little bit? Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Someone, let's see. Um, so, what do you think about the United Nations, Dad? I wish they would dump it in the ocean. <laughs> do the United Nations feet stink? We do not need the United Nations, and they don't do us any good. And they're trying to dominate the member countries. Hillary's trying to get a law passed that would allow the United Nations to dominate any rule or any law of any of their members and we don't want that and the united states is paying a big portion of the of the budget for the united nations i think we should take that budget away completely and and let them sink in the sea if they do if they will <laughs> yep I think your dad's right on point there um, yeah i changed the mic cable so hopefully that works now um I do want to know, though, uh, you were around when the United Nations first started. How did how did they pitch that to the people? How did they say, well, there'll be this world well, it government the, It was the League of Nations. Things. Didn't it come out of the League of Nations first? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think it was 
it sounded like a pretty functional and and uh, beneficial idea at the beginning to have all of the countries working together on one page they always they always sell the horrible tyrannical things with things that sound really good you know i mean who wouldn't want something that unites the world and makes everyone live in peace but that's not really what they do they don't any longer they've got different different uh, directions and different views and as Jack Donaghy on Thirty Rock says, what's with what's with the the blue helmets, the uh, the the robin's egg blue helmets? Where's that going to be good camouflage? An Easter egg hunt? <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, did did it was it did it start out as like a small thing that people didn't pay attention to? They didn't think anything would come of it. Was it just like, oh yeah, go ahead and have your little club there, or did they? Did the media portray it as something that would change the world, or did they portray it as just some little thing that you didn't have to notice? Oh, I think it was presented as something that would be beneficial to the whole world, and the media probably promoted that at the time. Well, wasn't the idea to prevent another world war? Isn't that how they sold it? That was one of their main ideas. Yeah. Hmm. It uh, it obviously hasn't done much to stop war because <laughs> there's been plenty of wars since the yeah. the United Nations started, and the United Nations is often involved with their quote unquote peacekeepers yeah. uh, mucking mucking things up by interfering. I think we've had too many wars. I think we're not not gaining, not benefiting by having all these wars. Now you wanted to volunteer in World War II, but you couldn't. What happened? Well, I was uh, my cousin and I went down to Dunkirk to the naval militia and got the enrollment papers. We were under 21, so we had to get our parents to sign. His dad was an old World War One Navy veteran. He signed immediately and sent him down there. My parents thought that over for several days, and they finally said, "Jack, why don't you wait till you're old enough to make up your own mind?" So, in other words, they were saying no to let me go in the Navy. And, but by the time I was 21, we had a, a draft board to sign jobs, and we were producing a heck of a lot of milk on a, on a two-man dairy farm, and the draft board would not change my draft from farm worker to military because I was producing so much food. Was that was the food being used for the war, or was it being consumed locally? Both, both. So they needed you to feed the soldiers, so they wouldn't let you be a soldier. Oh yes, there's a the uh, agricultural division was very important then because don't forget a lot of the agricultural workers were in the army, and the navy, and the marine corps, and so there, there were not enough people to continue producing the food and there were shortages of food some places wow did you have uh, a lot of friends who died in world war ii oh yes 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 i had friends in fact uh, that one thing i will mention after the war they came to me and said jack would you come and teach a class an evening class to these veteran re returning veterans on agriculture these guys want to be farmers and they've missed out on three years or four and so they wanted to start a school and have a, an instructor so I was still milking my own cows but I had a, a class two nights a week from 7.30 till 10 and had 16 veterans in that and one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life was I did not record the bull sessions afterward. <laughs> because they, they were from all the theaters, and I heard a lot of stories that just impressed me a great deal. I remember seeing your uh, teaching certificate for that. Now, was that a paid position or voluntary? And if it was paid, who paid for it? Was the government paying for that? or Yes, the government set it up, and I said, I can't do it. I don't have a teacher certificate. We'll take care of that. <laughs> went, went, went to the department, State Department of Education and got me a teacher's license. Did you have to take a test? No. <laughs> for, for three years. We'll, we'll take care of that. It was, it was good yeah. for three years with fully licensed teacher. But I had to make up the programs and conduct the programs and give these guys farm 
supervision too so it really was a good thing and these these were soldiers just getting back from world war ii soldiers sailors marines every theater every department were they uh were they polite and respectful or were they ever kind of out of line in class oh they were very respectful and they were very much a team were they Not very hard working too and eager to be productive members that's of right. society that's right they wanted to get back in it Right, but, right. Uh, I, I tell you a couple of examples. We had one guy that was kind of quiet, didn't say much. One Uh-oh. Night, one night he said, I saw the Brunner pass through a knot hole. Well, come on, Leslie, tell us about it. He said, our unit, with something like 80,000 men, got captured in Italy. The Germans loaded them into boxcars, standing room only, uh. and sent them north to prison camp. They couldn't sit down, they couldn't lie down, they couldn't do anything but to kind of move around a little bit. But there was a knot hole in the door of the boxcar, and they took turns looking at the beautiful Alps Mountains going through there. And then this, they, took, they took them on to Germany and put them in a prison camp. And this Leslie, who was a nice little guy, he, he volunteered on the farm to, to, uh, to help the in the prison to help the farmer and he knew so much about cows that the manager took a liking to him gave him good clothes and made sure he got fed and kept him going real good do you remember uh when i was about 10 i took classes in ham radio operation i think you drove me you drove me to the classes once a week i think it was in fredonia or jamestown Yes. It was like night school. I was the only non-adult in the class. Yes. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, I had a great interest in uh, radio as a kid. I guess you still do. <laughs> I guess I still do. Yeah. Just a minute. I'll take your picture. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Nima, you there? Pardon? Oh, I'm asking if Nima's there. Yo, I'm here. I was I was checking the background noise. Is it not fixed? Do you still hear it? Not right now, but it kind of creeps when you stop talking for a while. Ah, okay, okay. I'll mute when I stop talking. I um, have one more short story about a veteran in that, in that class. This one guy, two guys had a pilot's license before the war, and they both had visions of getting into a fighter plane and going over and cut, shooting all the Germans. But neither of them got that. They put the square holes in the square pegs in the round holes they sent one of them to class to teach the beginning guys a little something but the other one they sent him to Europe and sent him to England and he became a mechanic in an aircraft uh, field over there repairing planes but the problem was if they had a needed a part like a, a generator or a, whatever the part They'd send for it, and it would take a long time to get there, so they didn't get the pl planes put out very fast. This One day, this guy cranked up a single-engine plane in England, flew across the channel, landed in German territory in a cow pasture, went and took some parts off of one of our planes that had been shot down, flew back and put it on a plane and had a plane, another plane in the air that night. I said, it's no wonder we won that war with guys like that. So, did you, uh, any of the guys that you knew in World War II that came back, did any of them bring weapons back with them, either their American weapon or captured weapons? I think a lot of them did, but I wasn't much interested in, in that at that time. Um, I had a question, too. Um, a lot of people who are sort of of the mindset that the government doesn't do anything good and, and when they interfere in the market, they make uh, problems. They like to point out that after World War II, uh, there was sort of a big hubbub about what all the soldiers would do once they got back to the states, uh, i.e. there would be a lot of people ready to work but not a lot of jobs. Um, but it turned out, at least according to what I've read, that uh, – 
the people that came back were so eager to work that they all found jobs. Uh, if they couldn't find jobs, they started businesses, made their own jobs, um, and productivity actually increased all throughout the country. And there was sort of a boom time, you know, and that's what sort of led to the baby boom. Is, did you experience that? Is that kind of what you saw? Yes, I think there's a lot of truth in that. <clears throat> I don't think we had a, a big recession at that time because these guys were anxious to work and willing to work and really seeking jobs. Yeah, and you, and you sort of experienced that firsthand with, with these folks that you were uh, trying to teach. You said they were very eager to learn, weren't they? Yes, they were good students. And and did most of them end up you know going on to have farms or, or, or become successful in other ways? Most of them had farms. Cool. The, the two that had pilot license. I was leading up something there. In the class, one of these guys says, Jack, if you'll get an airplane, I'll teach you to fly. <laughs> I sold a cow and bought an airplane, and he taught me to fly. <laughs> and he never charged me anything for the lessons. And I went to Jamestown and took the, the pilot's uh, licensing test and passed it the first time. Wow. So I had my own airplane on the farm. That's awesome. So you're a pilot, too. I was. I didn't keep that up. What year was okay. that, Dad? That it was w- in the 1950s. And you were born what year? 21. Wow. Yeah, you uh, broke your leg. No, you broke your leg skiing, not in a plane, right? I, yes. I, as I told you, we started a ski resort, and Michael's sister, Connie, and I went over there one night after we got the cows milked to go to some evening skiing. And I came in, and they said, the the uh, editor of the Cleveland Press is here and wants to talk to you. So I went out looking for him. Didn't find him right off. Went up the hill and was coming down. And I came down. I, I'm not a racing skier, so I was kind of wailing back and forth and then gently come down the hill. This guy came down the hill like a rocket, going so fast he couldn't turn, and he hit me, knocked me about 40 feet, and broke both bones and my right leg at the boot top. And it was the ski instructor that did that. Anyway, I was on crutches and and had a full-length leg cast for six months. Wasn't your roommate in the hospital a motorcycle enthusiast, shall we say? A biker? I, I don't recall that. Oh, that's the story I heard. So, uh... Getting back to the soldiers coming back, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of like soldiers are less tough or less want to work now, but um, it seems like ever since the Vietnam War, a lot of people have come back from war with a lot more psychological trauma than they did in World War II. Did you find that true, or did you know guys in, that came back from World War II who had emotional or mental problems from battle? I think there were some in every war. I don't think it's one more one war only. I think that every war. Maybe they just didn't talk about it that much back then. That could be. Yeah. Didn't uh, wasn't there a guy in Westfield that was a v- uh, World War II vet that killed himself in his barn, shot himself? Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe people just kept it quiet and didn't talk to anybody about it, and then it just built up. It didn't did not get much publicity. Yeah, I think another thing too I heard is that um, in World War II, when people were done over in Europe, then they took ships back to America. Sometimes, and then they'd have to go to a hospital, even if they weren't injured, and be you know kind of like decompressed for a couple of days. And like the the amount of time from the battlefield to being back on the farm was about two weeks, whereas now it's about three days sometimes, and I think that in the two weeks of traveling and they'd be with other soldiers and they could talk things out a little bit, I think that did something to uh, kind of decompress the horrors of war a bit. Well, talk about traveling. What about the people that were in the Navy and the Army and the Marines full time? Like my brother, your uncle Ed, spent three years in the Navy as a radioman on a troop transport North Atlantic. And they learned after he got that position that he had gone to Bible school and wanted to be a minister, but he wasn't ordained yet. But they gave him a second job. They made him the ship's chaplain. 
So he had all these homesick kids going overseas to try to deal with. Didn't he end up in a mental institution? No, 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 he did not. He came home, got, got a job right away and worked for about one year. And then he went and got ordained. And he and his wife had wanted to be missionaries, but she was pregnant by then. And so they thought that wouldn't be fair. So they went to the um, American Baptist headquarters volunteered and they sent him to the Pacific Northwest to be a, a field missionary worker. I, I was thinking of Eddie. Is this his last name, Eddie? It's my 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 brother Ed. No, no. Who is the last name of Eddie that uh bought the scam oil land, got scammed out of his money from World War One, I, I think? Ida's brother, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, he was in the service and ended up in a mental hospital, right? That's true. Yeah, and uh, was that World War One? he was in? Yes. And he came back and had money and built a business, and then somebody bilked him out of it, telling him they were drilling oil wells in New Mexico, right? And we used right. to have the deeds for that. And, uh, right. You gave me a third of an acre of land there that I actually ended up selling for uh, like 700 bucks to buy guns at some point because I figured it would be more useful to me than ever seeing it. But You were you were so excited to sell that, I remember, because you wanted your AK. I wanted my AK-47, uh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but Did, he... Do you still have some of that land or...? I have still have some investment acreages but not that land. But you have you you uh, okay? You sold the New Mexico land, right? That was rattlesnake land. It was worthless, right? Yes, I sold yeah. that. Yeah. Did you ever did you ever visit that? Did you ever go to Kenna, New Mexico, population fifteen, and see that rattlesnake land? Yes, you did. Yes. What did it look like? Did it look like uh, more barren than Wyoming? <laughs> did it make Wyoming look like a metropolis? <laughs> I. There's a lot of similarities. <laughs> it, it, again, I use that term of land just holding the world together. Yep. <laughs> so, Nima, we got about uh, seven minutes here. You got any follow-ups? Yeah. Could I ask him a question? Sure. Of course. What, what's your hobby? Uh, He's doing it. <laughs> I've got Yeah, I've got a lot of hobbies. <laughs> um, yeah, one of my hobbies is to do podcasting, which we're doing right now. Uh, I've also really into music i like to uh i like to make electronic music i like to dj i like to make hip-hop uh i like to rap um so music is probably my biggest hobby the the next hobby would be uh you know online media uh podcasting blogging things like that dad nima's dad his father is from iran and fled iran right before the revolution in the 70s and came to america and started businesses Although what I'm learning now is it they didn't really flee him and his brothers. It was more like they came to the States to get an education. And then after the revolution happened, nobody wanted to go back. Uh, once, it was once, horrible. <laughs> once the Ayatollah Khomeini took over, uh, people were like, well, we might as well just stay in America because nobody wants to go back to, you know, a country that's ruled by a, a religious theocracy. OK, I hear you. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I feel like that same desire for freedom that my dad had when he was my age, I also have, but there's there's not really anywhere I can go to. You know, when the American government gets big, it's not like I can, I don't really feel safe going somewhere else to start anew. Um, maybe I'm not as adventurous as my dad. I don't know. But, and you were uh, born I, in Texas, which a lot of people used to think of as the place you go for freedom. Right. But I do think it's very sad that my dad sort of stayed in America because it was so free. Um, and now we're seeing freedoms just taken away every day, every month. Uh, the government getting way too big um, and, and just taking way much more power than they've had before, which I believe they had way, way too much before, you know, even in the 70s, but it, it just seems to grow exponentially. Well, let's face the fact, we are all immigrants, just depending yeah. on what year or what generation, with the possible yeah. exception of a few Native Americans. And that's quite a story. I'm writing a book about that. Now our last name Dean isn't it Irish not English isn't it wasn't it Odean and they changed it it was spelled differently in several places there was an A Dean Odean uh, 
had probably four or five different spelling. Now, who changed that? I know that at one point in America, Irish were not the popular uh, nationality and they were looked down on. Did someone change it from Odin to Dean to sound more English and less Irish? I don't think so. No? Okay. Hmm. Why Why did they change it? Well, because Odin was such a small part of it. Adeen and D E E N or Adeen, all of these different spellings pretty much came out of England. Is that A apostrophe Dean or just A D E A N? One of each. One of each. <laughs> all right. Well, we got a couple minutes left here, like uh, four minutes before we play our outro song. Uh, what do you think? What do you think would fix America? Well, what's your? You got four minutes for how to fix America, Dad. That's a tough question. <laughs> it's uh, it's more hurt, than four minutes. It, it's hurt so badly; it's going to take a lot to fix it. Mm -hmm. But we've got to reduce the size and dominance of governments, and I'm not just talking about federal. I'm talking about New York State. I'm talking about county. I'm talking about the village. Of Every one of these needs to be reduced in size from the towns, townships, counties, states, and federal. We have too much government in every one of those categories. How do you think, um, what kind of ways could people, what things could people do to ensure that the government gets smaller? Do you have okay, any ideas? Okay, let's, get, get let's, let's, let's start at the bottom. Take the town and the village. Each one of those, in fact, our town has five huge highway departments with big, big trucks and bulldozers and all that. And most of them stand idle all the time. Now, if the town and the village would combine, and there's some talk in that direction, if the two would combine their highway departments, they would eliminate the need of one department with millions of dollars in equipment. So that's a start, and they are talking about it now. Uh, counties, I don't see much there other than, well, our county is talking about reducing the number of, of legislators from a body of 25 to 17. All that would mean would be a slightly larger district for each one of these rural guys, but, but I would be very much in favor of that. And that's, that, that's all local business. But then you get into the states, and we have so much state government, they try, they're trying to run everything. Got to get rid of some of those departments. And federal... Do you, feel that, do you feel the same way on the federal level that getting rid of departments would be the way to go? Well, if he's got 69,000 new, 69 new departments with that many thousand people, I cannot conceive of any program that's needed to keep them going. I'd eliminate them all tomorrow. What would you eliminate first? What, uh, what would be the, well, they asked the president, uh, presidential candidates this, what three government agencies would you uh, eliminate if you were emperor of America? Well, I don't even have a list of them, but there's a lot of them that are absolutely worthless and needless. Okay. Well, Nima, you got that uh, song queued up there? Yeah, are we ready to roll out of here or what? In about twenty seconds, it's one minute okay. long, right? Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll be ready for that. I would like to uh, express my appreciation for your dad for coming on the show today. Uh, I think we learned a lot, and it was really great to hear from somebody who's lived through so much. Yes, I really, really liked having you on, well, Dad. Well, thank you for the compliment. I just want to reiterate my statement that I'm very, very proud of my son to create, help help create something like this and carry it on. I love you. And I'm trying to get you to uh, pitch in on one of my projects like this for years, but there's always been a scheduling conflict, but not today. So that's a great thing. <laughs> yes, I've enjoyed this very, very much. All, all right. right. And with that, we'll go ahead and say goodbye. Thank you all to, to the listeners. Thanks so much. And we'll see you next week. Yep. Yep. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. 
Then make a one-time gift via PayPal or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money. Thank you for listening to the Freedom Fiends Agenda. We'll be back streaming live every Thursday from 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. East Coast U.S. time on Adam Curry's No Agenda Global Radio. MP3 archives of all Freedom Fiends episodes are available free at freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Wow. 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 Wow.